God knows all about tomorrow. For tomorrow, the new year, we again experience His faithfulness. Good morning, everyone. Happy New Year. Turn to the person next to you and do greet him or her. Later on, we will stand and we will take time to greet the person farther from our seats or persons farther from our seats. And we praise and thank the Lord that on this final day of 2017, we can gather once more and worship Him in spirit and in truth. And also take time to remember His faithfulness. Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 to 24. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for Him. I am sure that we are thankful for a great many things this morning. As we look back at the past 12 months, at the past 365 days, may it be that today we thank the Lord together. So I invite everyone to bow their heads as we pause for a while to simply thank God as we begin our time as the body of Christ in worship. Father, indeed, great is your faithfulness. And we thank you that throughout this year, we have experienced it so. Thank you, Lord, for you are the unchanging God, the loving God, the Holy One, the great I Am. Spirit and in truth, we worship you and only you. To give praise for how you have been so good to us this year. To thank you for your care, your hand of blessing, your compassion, your grace, and your mercy. And to look forward to a new year that you will graciously bless us with. A new year to know you more. A new year to love you more. A new year to remain part of the body of Christ. And so we offer this gathering to you, for we pray these in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand. Let's put our hands together to give thanks to the Lord for His unfailing love and His love that indeed endures forever. We sing. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things, His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand, with a mighty hand, and now stretch 
strong you are God and we worship you we bless your name your name that is above all names your name that is great we sing blessed be your name in a land that is plentiful where streams of abundance flow blessed be your name Blessed be your name when I found in the desert place, when I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out. Next verse together. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. 
Blessed be the name of our God. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering, though there's pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing, every blessing you pour out. Bless your name, O Lord, our God. We declare that there is none like you. And it is you and only you who we ought to worship, to adore, and to honor. Let's continue to sing. One church, one faith, one anthem raised. God in God alone.
church as one body as one family we declare that you are God alone unshakable unchangeable unstoppable for indeed nothing and no one compares to you you the God of our church of our homes and our individual lives. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege to know you, to be loved by you, to be touched by you. And we look forward to this new year, for we know you will be there and you will always be. So we give thanks and praise to you, only you, our God alone. And we pray these in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 33, verses 3 to 4 writes, For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. Indeed, the Lord's unfailing, unending love is expressed to us even through His hand of blessing each day. And so we commit our gifts to Him in prayer. Let's bow our heads as the ushers come. Father, we thank You at this time for how You sustain us even through Your material blessing. Thank You, Lord, for indeed... And we say it time and again, may it never grow old on us that you are the God who provides, who sustains, and you are the generous God who meets all our needs each day. And so we give back what rightfully belongs to you, and we pray these in Jesus' name, amen.
We now go to the portion of our worship gathering where we read scripture together. You will also find in your bulletins uh, a brief uh, message from Pastor Larry as he is currently in Banawe to spend time with and minister with uh, one of our missionary doctors, Dr. Tony Ligot, and he will return in a couple of days. This morning, Pastor Emmer will deliver the final message for the year, and it is found in James chapter 4, verses 13 to 17. Open your Bibles to James chapter 4, as we read together, verses 13 to 17, and in reverence to the reading of God's Word, let's all stand. And let us read. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast and brag. All such boasting is evil. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it sins. May God bless the reading of his word. You may take your seats. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. It's the last day of 2017. And tonight will be the New Year's Eve. Are you excited? You don't look excited. Are we excited? Yes, yes I heard the kids saying they are excited. Well, I'm also excited to preach God's word with you. And God's message for us this morning, the New Year's message is entitled, Begin and End with God. You can take a look at your bulletin for the sermon message. It's not a sermon outline. It seems like everything has been written in the outline. Anyway, uh, allow me to start by asking each one of you, how many among you have already made plans for 2018? Major plans related to family, work, school, name it. I'm sure you have already made. As we look into or look out into the fast approaching new year, as I have said, I'm sure many of us have already started to make plans. Plans related to school, jobs, businesses, what else? Properties, health, if you have health concerns, marriage, if there's something that must be corrected in your marriage, and also family. How about vacation? Yes, this is part of our major plans as a family. Actually, we'll be having a vacation next week. My family and I are looking forward to it. Why? I did not have vacation this Christmas break. Yes, because I was preparing this sermon. <laughs> but don't worry. Hindi po masama ang loob ko. Masaya ko. I'm happy because I'm going to preach, imagine, God's New Year's message to many people in our services today. I already started last night. Pray for me that God would sustain me until I preach tonight. So the bottom line here is, as we plan for the following, including migration, retirement, which depends on our age and pre present situation, do we end this year, 2017, and then begin 2018 without making God part of our future ventures? You know, in making plans, it is essential to view these two things. The first one is right view of life. Right view of life. And the second one is right view of God. We need to take into account our mortality, that this life is not immortal. 
we also need to take into account that we have a God who is sovereign, who is in control of everything, our life, and also our future. You know, God is never against planning in our lives. It depends on how we approach it. So this morning, let me propose to you, brethren, approaching life without God will end in foolishness. But approaching it with fear of Him or fear of the Lord, it is the beginning of wisdom, as Proverbs would say. Allow me to commit our time together in prayer. We will ask the Lord to bless the study of His Word. Father, as we seek Your will for us this 2018 from Your Word, I pray that we will not only know it, but we will also do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Allow me to give you a brief background of the passage so that we will understand where James, the half-brother of Jesus, is coming from. You see, in his epistle, in his letter to the Jewish believers, he was actually, in this section, James 4, 13 to 17, addressing the arrogant, the ignorant, Jewish, wealthy merchants. So I'm sure a lot of us will be able to relate with this because some here are merchants. Some here are business people. And these merchants were in his assembly, if you will, in his church. And they had actually a wrong view of life and also a wrong view of God that must be corrected. So what's the wrong view? First, they knew there was a God just like us. But the problem is they are living their lives as if there's no God, as if God does not exist. In John MacArthur's book, he calls it practical atheism. Practical atheism. And then they even played God themselves, self-theism, making one God. Then the author showed them and all the readers, including us in this day and age, how to become a God-reliant believer who knows Him and then obeys His will. That is Christian theism. What is that? That is what Christianity is all about. Because Christianity is all about knowing God. And not just here, but also in our hearts, obeying what He wants us to do for Him, His people, and His kingdom. Now, there are three ways of approaching God's will in our lives. I call them the three Ds. You will see a lot of blanks in your bulletin. So those are the major points, the, the key words that I want for you to remember for 2018. And then we're going to also have five Ps, the sub-points, which in a way would reinforce or would explain what do I mean by our major points. Now, the first two, the first two Ds are actually referring to uh, foolish ways where one's life is lived without God. And then the last one is the wise way which every Christian ought to cultivate where one's life is lived with God. The first one is this, disregarding. Disregarding God's will out of ignorance of Him. Let's read about life's plan in verse 13 together. Can you read with me that verse? Ready? Go. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Brethren, is there something wrong in this type of planning? Something, is there something wrong? Actually, these are the elements of good planning. You business people, you know it. And I'm referring to first, projection. I have another five piece. Projection, what's that? Today or tomorrow, these merchants were saying. 
The second one is place. We will go to this or that city. And then, period, spend a year there. You know, it reminds me of my family and I. I we spent three years in Santa Rosa, uh, the Jesus Santa Rosa Church, where I was assigned there from 2006 to 2009. And then at GCF Northeast in Quezon City, in a far pl a place, we call it Far View. So I was assigned there by God. I was assigned there by Pastor Luis. Oh, no, I'm not saying Pastor Luis is God. But it is God using Pastor Luis. So Pastor Luis, wherever you are, <laughs> I'm sorry. But I thank him, no? for assigning me there, were it not for that, I would not be a better pars uh, person and pastor that God wants me to be. To be. And as we continue on, uh, we will also see here uh, purpose there, carry on business, and then the last one is profit, make money. So what's the problem here? The problem here is that the business or the good planning for business is incomplete without the last P. What's that? God's part. The part of God is not there. It's not in what was mentioned. So nothing wrong in what was mentioned. It is in what was not mentioned. And the person who was not mentioned here is God. I'm saying this because we have the tendency, though we are already believers, to be like the Jewish merchants. We make plans, but sometimes we disregard, we forget God, or to include God in our planning for our lives and also for our future. So this is planning life without with one's own projection, place, period, purpose, and profit, but without God's part on it. And this is the so-called practical atheism. Now, what do I mean by that? You know, intellectual atheism, which is what we know of the atheist, they believe that there is no God. How about practical atheism? They believe there is a God, but they conduct, they practice their lives as if there is no God. That's why it is called practical atheism. In a nutshell, these people disregard. These people ignore the will of God in their lives. Can you think of an example of a practical atheist in the scripture? Anyone? One of the parables of Jesus. The parable of the rich fool. He is an example of an ignorant, wealthy merchant who lived this life as if there is no God. Do we have practical atheists today? Do we have one? Allow me to read to you this story. It's kind of long, but we're going to learn a very important lesson here. Once upon a time in Silicon Valley, there lived a busy, important man. He routinely logged 12 to 14 hour days at his job and sometimes weekends, kind of workaholic. He picked up an MBA and joined professional organizations and boards of directors to expand his contacts. His work was not only his occupation, but it is also his preoccupation. His wife tried to slow him down to remind him, hey, you have a family. He was vaguely aware that his kids were growing up and he was missing it. I'll be more available to them in six months or so, he said to himself, when things settle down. Besides, I'm doing it all for them. That's what he said. He knew that he was not taking great care of his body, so his doctor told him, he had some pretty serious warning signs, you know, elevated blood pressure, high cholesterol, and told him he needed to cut down on the red meat and start an exercise program. Guess what he did? He stopped 
going to his doctor. There will be plenty of time for that, he said to himself, when things settle down. He recognized that his life was out of balance. His wife nagged him about, let's go to church. There was one down the street for them or from them. He intended to go, but he prided himself on being a practical man who lived in the real world where money is how you keep score. Besides, he said, I can be spiritual without going to church. He said to himself, I'll, I'll just pray at home. There will be plenty of time for that sort of thing, he said, when things settle down. One day, the COO, the chief op operations officer of his company, came to see him to ask him to do something big for the company. His boss said, you won't believe this, but things are booming. Orders are coming in so fast that supply can keep pace with demand. Our software is hopelessly outdated. If we don't overhaul this operation from top to bottom, it will be a disaster. Then it hit, it hit him. He would put his company through technological revolution. But it will be at the expense of his time for his family. He said to his wife that night, Han, do you realize what this means? We can relax. Our future is assured. Is assured. We're set for life. This means financial security. We can finally go on vacation that you've been pestering me about. But his wife had heard this story a long time ago. So she just went up to bed by herself, as usual. Now, his wife woke up at 3 a.m. And he, the husband, was still not beside her. She went downstairs to drag him to bed, but when she touched him on the shoulder to wake him up, he did not respond. Later, the paramedics told her that he had suffered a massive heart attack, that he had already been dead for hours. His death was a major story in the financial community. His obituary was written up in Forbes, in the Wall Street Journal. Then came the memorial service. People got up to eulogize him. Mostly, they talked about his accomplishments. Because while everybody knew about him, no one really knew him. He was one of the leading entrepreneurs of his day, said one. He was an innovator of technology and delivery systems, said another. They had commissioned a large marble memorial column for him. On it, they wrote all these inspiring words, visionary, innovator, leader, entrepreneur. And at the top, they wrote this word, that man's favorite word, the word he'd given his soul for, and that is success. They put up the man's memorial stone buried his body and went home. Then, when it was dark and no one was present, the angel of God was sent to this cemetery. Then on the man's wonderful memorial stone, the angel traced with a finger the single word, God had chosen to summarize this wealthy, busy, respectable, successful man's life. And that word is not success, but fool. God said, you fool, this very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? Have you seen, brethren, yourself in this story? That is practical atheism. The story, just like verse 13 presents a wrong view of life and God. What's the wrong view of life and God? Life is simple, and then God is not needed. No, life is not simple. It is complex. In Tagalog, life is not simple. Hindi siya basta-basta. For foreign friends, it means it is not just just. 
It is not simple. So the point here is we, we need God. You know, quoting from John MacArthur's commentary, he said here, life is an infinite complexity of forces, events, people, circumstances, all beyond your control and my control. So variable, so utterly uncontrollable that is beyond any man to either ascertain the future or design the future or control the future. Remember the five P's I mentioned to you? Those will change projection, place, purpose, period, profit. Those will change. Only God does not change because God is sovereign. He is in full control of our lives. He's in full control of our economy and name it, including, of course, our future. That's why the writer of the Proverbs wrote in 16.1 and also 16.9, and I quote, To humans belong the plans of the heart, but from the Lord comes the proper answer of the tongue, meaning God has the final say. And then in verse 9, the writer of the Proverbs continue, In their hearts, humans plan their course. But the Lord what? Establishes their steps. There you go. We see here that God is sovereign. So we don't, we should not disregard Him and His will when it comes to planning. Because whether you like it or not, as I have said, life is not simple. But to God, it is simple. We need Him because He is sovereignly in control of our lives and also our situation. Yes, brethren, we have to plan ahead. There's nothing wrong about it, but in our planning, make sure that God has a, has a significant part in our future ventures. So that to the point we will allow God to step in, we will allow God to interrupt we will, God, we will allow God even to alter or change our plans should it be His wish to do so. As someone said, and I like the way it was stated, you can write your plans in pencil, then give God the eraser. Write your plans in pencil, then give God the eraser. That's the right attitude when it comes to planning your life with God. Reflection. On a scale of one, are you ready for this evaluation? You know, it's the last day of 2017. We have to assess ourselves, right? On a scale of one, hardly ever to 10, always, okay? Lowest one, highest 10. How often do you pray about your plans and decisions before making them. How often do you pray about your plans and decisions before making them? How many are in between? How many are far from 10? I say very far. Allow me to give you a suggestion. And I need to do my assignment. Uh, as announced already, you can start your year in prayer using this as your prayer guide. And it is available in the lobby. But if you're going to get it from me, it will only be for 20 pesos. But wait, there's more. I will also sign your parking ticket for free. <laughs> so I did my assignment. I hope, kidding aside, you will get one before you leave, as this will aid you in being a prayerful person that God wants you to be for 2018. Life's perplexity. Life's perplexity. What I mean by perplexity is plans can and do change. Plans can and do change because future is not secure. Let's read all together verse 14a. Ready? Go. Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. 
How many among us here know what will happen to 2018? Anyone? Will China be the new superpower next year? Will North Korea do a nuclear strike? As in tonight, to join the fireworks display? I'm just kidding. <laughs> what will happen to our economy in 2018 under Duterte's or President Duterte's administration? Will there be another super typhoon like Yolanda? Will the big one happen? How about the SOGI bill, Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity Bill? How about the impeachment complaint against C.J. Serrano? Do you know what will happen? Somebody told me, Pastor, it's better that we don't know them. So we won't be terrified. You know, you won't be hurt in something that you do not know. You know, this verse, 14a, that we read earlier, is similar to Proverbs 27.1. And the writer of the book of Proverbs said, Do not boast about tomorrow. And the point there is, For you do not know what even a single day may bring. So don't boast about your tomorrow. Real estate developer Larry Silverstein can bear witness to the truth or to the truth of that text. Though he owned impressive property in New York, he was, according to his testimony, and he said, he's obsessed by the desire to add the great twin towers of the World Trade Center to his holdings. His wish, brethren, came true. He had obtained a 99-year lease worth $3.2 million, or billion, three. $3.2 billion for that majestic center. Six weeks before those two imposing skyscrapers were destroyed by terrorists. Imagine, $3.2 billion gone with the wind. No one knows what will happen to our future, but only God, and only God knows. No one has a guarantee of tomorrow, no one knows for certain what the next year, 2018, or even this day, this very hour will bring. Only God can bring about what He wills for the future without, what? Without fail. Why? Because our God is omniscient. The unknown future is safe. Where? In the hands of this all-knowing God, and then each day is a gift from Him. Do you still remember from your memory one of the most quotable verses in the Old Testament? Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Life is not uncertain to God. However, brethren, it is uncertain to man. Life is uncertain to man. So earlier, we have learned that life is not simple. Here, we are learning that life is not sure. Life is not sure. So if life is not sure, you and I need who? We need someone who is certain. We need someone who is sure about what will happen to the future. And to be able to do so, we need faith. Someone said that faith is not knowing what the future holds, but knowing who holds the future. On this slide, you will see a picture, actually pictures of a building. Uh, I'm in no way promoting city land. I have no cut <laughs> in what I will do as I promote it. But I am promoting what they have on top of each of the buildings they are building. What is that? And also that uh, paper bill, it's $100. What do you see there? In God we trust. Such a good reminder for business people, is, isn't it? That life 
is unsure, but in the hands of God, if we will just put our trust in Him, then things will go well as we put our faith in Him. You know, Psalm 39 verse 4, the psalmist said, Show me, Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Show me, Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Why is the psalmist saying that? Because he believes. He believes that God knows the future. And he does not only know the future, he also holds it in his hand. As an old hymn would say, or it goes, and allow me to quote the lyrics. Later on, we're going to sing this wonderful hymn. God knows all about tomorrow. He can see beyond today. Be it filled with joy or sorrow, He has planned it that way. So, I do not fear the future. On His promises, I stand. God knows all about tomorrow. For what? He holds it in His hands. Do we say amen to that? A middle-aged woman had a heart attack and she was taken to the hospital. Now, while she was being operated, he had this so-called near-death experience. And so he was before, she was before God asking the Lord, is my time up, Lord? No, you have another 43 years, two months, and eight days to live. Now, upon recovery, the woman decided to stay in the hospital and have a facelift, nose lift, bus lift, and everything in her body was lifted up. <laughs> and not only that, she also decided to change the color of her hair. See, since she had so much time to live, she figured she might as well make the most of it. Now, after her last operation, she was released from the hospital, and while crossing the street, an ambulance hit her, and it killed her instantly. Now, when she went to heaven, she was before God, she complained, God, I thought you said I had another 40 plus years. Why did you pull me from the path of the ambulance? God replied, I'm sorry, I did not recognize you. Brethren, life is short, and it will even be shorter if the Lord would not recognize you. That's the lesson. Life's perishability. Life's perishability. Let's read verse 14b all together. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Remember seeing a rushing truck with this sign, perishable goods do not delay. So what do you do? You give way. The problem is, is we're like that, but it seems that we don't have the sense of urgency. Just like those perishable goods, we are highly perishable because we are not immortal. Anytime, we can die anytime we can go. So here we will see life is brief. As we review, we have learned that life cannot be simple. Life cannot be sure. Here, life cannot be sustained. Because life is brief. It is like a mist. Mist in Tagalog is hamog. I've seen one when we went to Baguio for the Sibab biennial conference, and then suddenly it vanished away. Mist in Greek is atmos or atmis. Sounds familiar? Atmos, fear. So it can literally mean air, vapor. And here we have the, we have the translation mist because you see it now and then in a split second or a few seconds it will be gone. You see, upon reading this verse, it reminded me of my brother-in-law, whose name is Jesse Maglano. Maybe you've seen him walking, most of the, attending the, the service here, 
and most of the time staying in the lobby. He's a six-footer guy. And you know what? Just mid-year last year, he died due to heart failure. We, he's saying my age, we did not expect that to happen. Until now, actually, I cannot believe that he's already gone. So life is a mist. You're here right now, listening to me. We don't know what will happen as you go out from here. I'm not scaring you. I'm just telling you the reality of the mortality of our lives. Any time can be a time to depart and to meet our maker. You know, this is something Job observed. Although he made use of other imagery, not a mist, he made use of shadow, which is also temporary, and also flowers that wither away. How quickly anyone can succumb to sickness or meet accident or experience trage tragedy illustrates how frail or perishable man really is. Maybe you still remember the fire victims in a certain mall, at a certain mall in Davao, and also the typhoon victims of Vinta. Did these people who died know that they won't make it to 2018? No idea. No idea. And yet right now, they're already dead. Why do we seem ignorant that any time we can die? Is it, we, is it because we are denying it? Because that's something scary? We don't think or discuss that too often because it is morbid and depressing. Just like how you're feeling today. Pastor, it's New Year. We want to be happy. Why are you so morbid and depressing? <laughs> it's God's Word telling us that we have to be reminded of our perishability. We are highly perishable. Someone said, and I quote, life is like a tissue paper. The closer you get to its end as you unroll it, the faster it goes. Same true with our life, especially when we get old. Will you live to be 100? Anyone here? So you can get 100,000 from the government. You know, magazine publisher J.R. Rodale, a zealous advocate of health foods, claimed at the age of 72 that he would live to be 100. Now listen to this. The same week that his prediction appeared in the New York Times, it was published, he was being interviewed for a TV program, again claiming that his bones were as strong as ever. Now moments after making his boast, he died of a heart attack. Next, Dr. Stuart Berger, a nutritionist. Yes, Dr. Berger is a nutritionist. <laughs> and you know what? This is real. Dr. Berger, B-E, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, no? B-E-R-G-E-R, -E -E he claimed that he had the formula for living past the century mark. He had it in his hands. Although he had supposedly found the secret of youthfulness and had convinced many to follow his advice, listen to this, he died in his sleep at age 40. Gross, grossly overweight. Finally, then there was author Jim Fix, Jim Fix, who advocated running to prevent coronary trouble. Running to prevent coronary trouble. Yet at the age of 52, he died of a heart attack. How? Yes, ironically, while running. So brethren, who among you here knows how long will you, how long will I live? Anyone among here? We don't know. That explains why coffins come in different sizes. We have small, we have medium, we have large. Take your pick. This is what I have for you right now. Now, the question is this. 
what if by 2018, this will be the question that we're going to face? Next slide. Who's next? Now, you're no longer laughing. Next slide, this will... <laughs> you're still laughing. <laughs> but seriously, any time can be a time to go. Just like what happened to my brother-in-law, including also Pastor Luis, whom we miss a lot. He was here. but he's no longer here. But we know he's, he's in a better place. And also my brother-in-law. And I know that some of you, or many of you, as you end 2017, are feeling sad because one of your loved ones passed away. Because that's the reality, brethren, whether we like it or not. We are not immortal. That's why we need, we need God. Because God is the life giver. He is the life sustainer. He is the life giver. Now, while man counts his years at each birthday, God teaches him to number his days. I like that. Man counts his year at each birthday. Like this January 15, I will be turning 40 plus. No, I won't be revealing. 40 plus. That's how I count my year. And I believe the same applies to you. But you know, God is teaching us not just to count our birthdays, but to count each day, each hour, each second of our lives. Because we don't know what will happen next. Someone said that life is like a notebook, just like this journal. I'm not promoting it again. But you see, just to illustrate, uh, it, life is like a notebook. The first and the last pages, God has written something. The first page is the birth, and then the last page is death. But in between, the center pages are empty. So it's for you to fill. It's for you to fill. Now, how are you going to use your life wisely? So here, we are advised to use our days, our years wisely by how investing your life in those things that are eternal. You know, I believe in balanced Christian living. It's good to invest for financial security. There's nothing wrong about it. But make sure that you don't neglect the reality of eternity. Remember, your life is a gift from God. And it must be lived according to His ways. So stop disregarding God's will out of your ignorance of Him. Get to know Him and get to know His will for 2018. Now, if you have not yet received Christ and you're listening to me, it's never too soon to accept Christ. You can do it today. But at any moment, let me remind you, it could be too late. So what have we learned so far? We have learned that while life may not be simple, Life may not be sure. Life may not be sustained. We have a God who is sovereign. We have a God who is all-knowing. We have a God who is a life giver. Do not disregard Him. Regard Him as you begin and end your year. The second one is disobeying. Disobeying or defying God's will. <clears throat> Excuse me. Out of arrogance before him. Disobeying God's will out of arrogance before him. <clears throat> In 1 John 2.16, John said, there are two major sins. The first is the lust 
of the flesh, lust of the eyes. What's the third one? There you go. Pride of life or life's pride. In a certain pond on one of the farms in the east were two ducks and a frog. Now these neighbors were the best of friends, so they would play together. Unfortunately, summer came, and so the, pie, the pond rather dry up. So it's time to move to another place. Now the ducks could fly. How about their poor friend, the frog? Finally, it was decided that they would put a stick in the bill of uh, each of the ducks, and then the frog would hang on onto the stick with his mouth, and then they would fly him up in the air to go to a certain place where there's water. And so they did. As they were flying up high in the air, a farmer out in his field looked up and saw them and said, well, isn't that a clever, clever idea? As he saw the frog biting the stick, I wonder who thought of it. The frog said, I did. And so the frog had a great fall. Brethren, that happens when there is pride in us. We will fall. Can you read with me verse, verses 16 to 17? <clears throat> As it is, you boast and brag. All such boasting is evil. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. You know the word evil there, poneros, is wicked. Use of Satan. Who is the inventor of self-theism? Self-theism. For him, he is higher than God. That's why God caused him to fall. Another example of such is King Nebuchadnezzar. And I guess he's an idol of, uh, idol of Saddam Hussein. You know, modern-day Babylon is Iraq. He's an example of an arrogant monarch or king who lived his life as if he was God. That's self-theism. And um, we will see in Daniel 4.30 what he said, and I quote, if you can read from your Bible. <clears throat> this is what he said. Is not this great Babylon I have built as the royal residence? By my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty. In a few seconds, while he was saying that, what happened to him? We know the story. He was punished by God. He experienced a great fall. So man's boasting. Why do people boast? Like Nebuchadnezzar. It is actually a cover-up of one's weakness. So man's boasting only covers up man's weakness. As Thomas Akempis said, man proposes, God disposes. Solomon said it first, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision, it's every decision is from the Lord. So one must not disobey. One must not disobey God and his will because God is sovereign and in control he is omniscient. However, man is frail or man is weak. He, he cannot control future events as we have studied earlier. He has neither the wisdom to see the future nor the power to control the future. So to plan without taking into consideration God's will is to set oneself up above, up above God himself, making oneself God. So planning, making your plans for 2018 without God is a form not only of practical atheism, but also self-theism. As if you're in control of your life. As if you're in control of your future. As if you know everything. As if you are immortal. 
It is sin, brethren, to plan this way. You know why? Especially among us. We Christians know better. So it is one thing to know the right thing to do. It is another thing to start doing the right thing. And if you don't, you sin. This is the so-called sin of omission. You know, sometimes we put so much emphasis on the sin or sins of commission. Sin of commission is committing to do the wrong thing. As simple as that. While sin of omission is omitting to do the right thing. But you know, one sin is as evil as the other. One sin is as evil as the other. You know that it is wise to begin your 2018 and end it with God. And then you fail to do it. That is sin of omission. As evil as sin of commission. Edmund Burke said, The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Passivity. So if you continue to live as though you're running your own life, brethren, you are sinning. If you want to stop playing God, first discover what is the right thing to do. And upon discovering it, what do you have to do? Do it. You know it. It's time to act on it. Why? So you won't sin. You won't sin or commit the sin of omission. Finally, doing God's will out of reliance on Him. And this is the right view of life and God. The last P is life's perspective. Life's perspective. Can you read with me verse 15? Everybody? Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. How many among you are fond of using the expression, Lord willing? You know, it's good. Lord willing, I'll be traveling abroad. I'll be going to this school. I will be conducting business in this place, Lord willing. But let me remind you, let it not just be a statement or a word from our mouths. Let it be the constant attitude of our hearts. Lord willing, if God will permit, I will do this, I will do that. Just like what Jesus did and Paul, I have two examples here of people who are doing God's will. The first one is Jesus. Jesus said in John 4, 34, My food is to do the will of God. My food is to do the will of the Father who sent me and to finish His work. And even in His prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, we would hear Him, as you can see in the picture, His prayer saying, Yet not my will but yours be done. And even in the disciples' prayer, you know, our Father out in heaven, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The focus of Jesus is always the will of God. And then not only Jesus, his follower by the name of Paul. Paul is an example of a God-reliant servant who lived his life with God as he refused referred to the will of God whenever he shared his plans with his friends. We no longer have time to look into those verses. But you will see in the six verses, Paul would always say, if God permits, God willing, Lord, if Lord is willing, many times in his plans, he would say that. How about you? How about you? In planning for 2018, is it important to say, if it is the Lord's will, I will do this, I will do that. I hope it will be very important for us. Obeying God's will is like obeying the laws of the universe. One of the laws of the universe is the law of gravity. Okay, if you will cooperate, it will cooperate with you. But if you don't, it will go against you. You know, if you will defy the law of the gravity, what will happen to you? You will die. The same applies 
with God's will. So we better obey God's will. Now, can we know God's will? Is there anything written in the scripture about God's will? In Tagalog, may nasusulat po ba sa kalooban ng Diyos? Meron. We have here six clear declarations of God's will in your life. Are you ready? The first one, and this is my wish for all of us for 2018. The first one is this. God wants you to be saved. Second, God wants you to be spirit-filled. God wants you to be sanctified. God wants you to be submissive. God wants you to be satisfied in Him. And also to suffer for Him. Now, knowing His will in your life is one thing. Doing it is another thing. Are you saved? No, pastor. Then this 2018, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ while there is still time for you. Are you spirit-filled? No. Then be controlled by the Spirit this new year. Are you sanctified? No. Then live up your life. Get rid of, immortal, of immorality in your life. Are you submissive? No. Then start submitting to human authorities, to the government, to the company where you're working, to school, to church, and please don't forget it, this at home. You wives, and I know husbands will be happy for this, continue to submit to your husbands. Are you satisfied in him? No, pastor? Then, ask the Lord to give you a grateful. You know, uh, satisfaction in him is in reference to give thanks in all circumstances. So if you're not satisfied in the Lord, you ask the Lord, Lord, help me to be grateful this coming new year. Finally, this is the hard one. Are you suffering for him? If your answer is yes, then be patient in enduring it. The Lord has something for you. If you are suffering for him or if you are suffering for righteousness sake. I want you to join the psalmist. Listen to what the psalmist said. Psalm 48, 48 rather. Psalm 48. I desire to do your will, my God. I desire. If I may rephrase it, Lord, I am excited to do your will for 2018. Those six verses, I will do one of them, if not all of them. And if you don't know how to do it, perhaps your answer is, Lord, how can I apply one of those six? Join the psalmist in saying, Psalm 143.10, teach me to do your will, for you are my God. This is actually a prayer that we can pray later on. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. And then finally, as a Christian, be reminded of this for 2018. In 1 Peter 4.2, Peter said, Do not live the rest of your earthly life for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. So anything, any sin that we have for this year, let's leave them behind as we confess them to the Lord and ask for His forgiveness. 2018, it's a year to have a fresh start. Give yourself a chance to change your ways. As I will also do the same for myself. Since your life span, since your life success are in God's hand. Remember the verse, in Him we live and move and have our being. Reliance on His sovereign will is a must for you and also for me. For final thoughts, what now are your plans for 2018? Have you set dates? Are you planning the right way? Have you marked on your calendar without considering what God thought? Does God have any say or final say in your schedule? Do you make God your lesser partner in your business or you're making Him your greater partner? 
You know, Proverbs 16, 3 says, and I quote, commit whatever you do to the Lord. And then what? Your plans will succeed. How do we commit ourselves to God? We can do that in prayer. And we will do that later on. Commit now to God in prayer. All your plans in the future. But please, let us include the will of God for our lives. You know why? Because God only desires the best for you. What is best for you? What is best for me? Finally, someone said, and I quote, No one can go back and start a new beginning, but anyone can start today and make a new ending. What's the point here? The point here is you cannot start over 2017. It's almost done. It's New Year's Eve tonight. There's nothing that you can do. But you can begin again right in 2018, making things right for your life, for your future. Do you want a new ending this new year? Anyone here? Do you want a new ending this new year? Then listen to this. Begin your year with God by doing His will so that you will end 2018 also with Him. Now that you know the right thing to do, do it. For if you don't, you sin. As the chorus of this hymn was read to us earlier, why don't we sing it together? God has measured time's duration, night and day are His creation, and the changing seasons of the year. He's the one who watches o'er me and prepares the way before me. There is nothing now I need to fear. God knows all about tomorrow. He can see beyond today. Be it filled with joy or sorrow. Uncertainties may haunt me, foolish fears may try to taunt me, till my heart is filled with doubt and dread. He who set the planet spinning sees the end from the beginning. He will keep me through the days ahead. Together? God knows all. stand together as we sing the third verse. All the world is in confusion, peace on earth is but illusion, and the phrase seems 
is only a cliche. But in trying times so fearful, I can still be calm and cheerful. And with glad assurance, I can say one last time, God knows all about tomorrow. He can see beyond today. Be it filled with joy or sorrow, He has planned. Such a wonderful hymn. God knows all about tomorrow, for He holds it in His hands. As we close 2017, I want for us to close it through this prayer. I prepared a prayer for us, and I hope that as we utter this prayer, we will mean it from our hearts. You can please hold the hand of the person next to you and utter this prayer before God with witnesses around us. Let's pray right now. Dear God, thank you for teaching me the right view of life in you. That planning my life without you is foolish because life is not simple, not sure, not sustained. But planning my life with you is wise because you are sovereign, all-knowing, and a life giver. I pray against the enemy and his schemes to make me disregard or disobey your will. Forgive me for my ignorance and arrogance before you. Take away the pride in my heart and replace it with complete reliance on you. As I submit my plans to you this 2018, I pray that I may consider first what your will is for me. If you want me to be saved, save me. If you want me to be spirit-filled, sanctified, submissive, satisfied in you, and even to suffer for you, teach me to do your will. For you are my God. And now that I already know the right thing to do, help me to do it as I begin and end my year with you in Jesus name now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant make you complete in every good work to do his will working in you what is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever that God's people say amen on behalf of my family happy new year <laughs>